He is co-author of many of the current nutrient management guides for OSU and the Pacific Northwest. Let's welcome Dan. How's that? Okay. So one of the good things about uh, soil fertility is that you get to uh, work with all aspects of uh, soil science and cropping. So actually what I'm going to talk about today, soil biology, that's a smaller box than uh, soil fertility. So this morning I'm going to talk more about biology and this afternoon I'll talk more about chemistry. Um, the title of your workshop, uh, Building Soils, uh, that's actually uh, hard to do. Soils are equilibrium systems, meaning that they like to get in balance between the inputs and the outputs. Uh, there's a couple of uh, scenarios up here on the title slide of uh, how if you do something repeatedly uh, for many years, you can change equilibrium to a new level. And that's kind of a consistent theme you'll see as we go through in terms of uh, building soil. Okay, so organic matter. If uh, I should have put this on the uh, quiz at the beginning here, but if you ask most people, you know, what is the most important thing about soil biology, they're going to say soil organic matter. And that's because organic matter uh, has many, many different functions. Uh, the biggest one being that it's the food or the energy that uh, drives a lot of the biological processes that we have. And so uh, the quest for the perfect uh, soil biological indicator usually revolves around how can we measure organic matter in a way that is meaningful relative to our goal. Now historically, um, the big issue with soil uh, organic matter was soil conservation. Uh, this isn't taken too long ago, and you can see that uh, there are not, uh, there's not perfect control of, of uh, soil erosion in some fields. Uh, these are near Pendleton. And also wind erosion uh, is a problem there, as it is here, that uh, when you don't have a covering of organic matter on the soil surface, you've got much more susceptibility to dust uh, getting up and flying around and causing various problems from that. So um, aside from what I'm going to say, all the specifics, what you should take home is that uh, really uh, it's all about reducing tillage and it's all about leaving residue on the surface. And if we look across the Midwest since they started doing uh, reduced or, or no-till. Organic matter in every state that has data, it's been going up over the last 20 years as a consequence of not stirring the soil up as much and not promoting as much decomposition of organic matter. So that's probably, you know, the goal is to figure out how to grow crops with less tillage. So here's some numbers to illustrate the idea that uh, um, if you wait long enough, you can see some pretty big differences in organic matter. Uh, typically, the problem you have with measuring organic matter is you're measuring for one or two or three years. And you can see from this information that it took quite a while for changes to become apparent. And changes become really big after, I guess this is uh, 70 years or so. And these different lines, they're just kind of different management strategies that the one on the bottom there is the uh, scorched earth policy. Uh, burn up all the, all the crop residue and don't apply any fertilizer to help grow new residue. So that's the lowest soil organic matter at the end of the period. And the one on top is the, uh, the most additions going in. It's, it's a system where they applied manure on an every other year basis during the whole history of this uh, experiment. So you can see quite a different outcome with time. So that's another, another thing to uh, keep in mind is when you're talking about building soils, you kind of need to be patient. Um, 
whoever was responsible for farming in, in 1930, uh, you're probably still dealing with some of their uh, legacy. All right, so uh, in, in preparing for such a broad topic, uh, I tried to uh, quiz the uh, conference organizers and some growers about what kinds of things people are thinking about, what questions could be thought about or answered here. So I'm going to kind of have this structure to the presentation that uh, I'll have a question and then, and, and then I'll have some uh, discussion about it. So the question was, uh, you know, what is the benefit of uh, higher biological activity and is more activity always uh, what we're looking for? So uh, I'm going to steal liberally from my colleagues and you'll see some credits as we go through here. Um, so in terms of goals for uh, soil biology, uh, a lot of these have to do with many of the big goals we have are actually biological goals. We want more nutrients from organic sources. We want air and water to infiltrate easily into the soil, and that's usually a consequence of having better structure, which is mediated by organic matter. Um, Lindsay did a great job of talking about how organic matter manipulation can encourage or suppress root diseases. Uh, if we have a better structure of our soil and more organic matter, usually we're going to store more, more water that's available for the plant. And apart from just the disease issues that were talked about earlier, generally speaking, if you have a more porous medium that uh, has a good balance of air and water, you're going to get better root systems and you're going to have better habitat for beneficial organisms like mycorrhizal fungi. So actually a lot of the, the goals we look for in building soil are biological in nature. Okay, so um, John Duran was a, a uh, or is a uh, authority in the world of soil quality now referred to as soil health. And uh, he uh, developed a list uh, that's reproduced here of uh, what, you know, if you're looking for the holy grail of biological indicators, what you're looking for, it should be able to measure something. It should be sensitive. Uh, it should actually correlate to something that is important to the person using the soil. Um, it would be helpful if we knew how the black box works, you know, why does this biological indicator correspond to benefit? It'd be nice if everybody could understand how to interpret the test, and it should be uh, easy and inexpensive to measure. So how many of you think that this test has been found yet? Well, there's uh, some tests that uh, do some beneficial that get pieces of this, but uh, I'm kind of here to report that we aren't there yet. So in terms of, of uh, soil health goals, there's sometimes a conflict between a soil health goal and a nutrient management goal, and I want to point those out. Um, if we add a lot of inputs that are high in nitrogen, we may actually create a situation where we're having more nitrate leaching to groundwater than our conventional system. Because remember, we lose control of uh, the uh, mineralization process once the organic matter is in the soil. It's going to respond to temperature and moisture in the soil. And so um, in a lot of ways, our nitrogen from organic matter is harder, harder to control than nitrogen from fertilizer. The other one is not so important for you here, but uh, in places that are blessed with abundant surface water, like in western Washington, western Oregon, uh, what we find is that if we're adding a lot of manure products, we're adding more phosphorus than is needed for that the manure has too much phosphorus relative to nitrogen. And so we end up with building up soil phosphorus to levels that actually contribute when water runs off, off the fields it actually causes problems in water, algae blooms, and so on. So I went to the uh, web, and uh, you can find many things there. 
And, you know, this is a map that uh, USGS put together in, in uh, 2009 for some of the real estate uh, near Moses Lake. And where it's red, that's where they have high nitrate in groundwater, high being uh, greater than 10 parts per million. So I would say that, you know, in this area, you definitely have to consider nitrogen in everything you do with uh, management of soil biology. So what is the right amount of, uh, or, or, of, of organic matter for my soil? Well, we have to go back and kind of think about, you know, what are the forces that control how much organic matter we have? So organic matter is in a system in soil. It's kind of its own little ecological system. You've got uh, decomposition and, or, and biomass being um, created and uh, decomposed. And they're in equilibrium with all these other processes that I won't go into detail here, but uh, just to make clear that you know, we're not dealing with adding something to soil and it being simple, it's pretty complicated. Uh, also, um, I have to confess that uh, I, I bear some um, prejudice. Uh, I'm prejudiced against uh, agronomic information that always emanates from the Midwest. And the thought that, uh, you know, us out here on the wide open spaces should get with it and get like the Midwest. Um, I want to say that you know, we're starting at a radically different place than the Midwest. Uh, the typical grassland soil uh, in the order mollusols, that's the typical soil in Iowa, in Iowa and I Illinois and so forth, the one on the right. The one on the left, uh, I have no idea where this is, but it's in the, it's in the same order as uh, a uh, Quincy soil, where you're dealing with uh, quite a bit less soil formation than the one on the right. So my point is that we're never going to make our soil into a soil that occurs in the Midwest. It's just not possible. So we have to think about what's possible within the constraints of the environment that we have. So as far as, as organic matter levels in soil, the biggest factor is actually how much clay the soil has because the clay is what actually binds with organic matter and kind of protects it from decomposition. So if we look at soils with, with the different textures, we're going to find more organic matter almost universally in soils that are higher in clay than in sandier soils. So our goal needs to be adjusted according to what texture we're looking at. And also, almost universally, the more we till, the more we decompose organic matter, so we shift the balance towards uh, decomposition, so lower levels. Um, in the basin here, we've got pretty good conditions for decomposition. We're warm in the summer, and it's wet because we're irrigating. And those are both factors that are needed to accelerate the rate of decomposition. So it's really hard to get a, lot, get a high organic matter soil in, in, under these conditions. So moving on to the next question. This is kind of, kind of setting the background. So is a soil respiration test a good indicator of soil health? So let's have a show of hands. Who wants to do a soil respiration test as an indicator of soil health? Okay, so a respiration test is, I'm going to take soil and I'm going to put it in an uh, enclosed container of some kind, and I'm going to measure how much uh, CO2 is uh, produced by the biology that's in the soil. So would that be a good uh, indicator? Absolutely. He's uh, voting early and voting often for respiration. Excellent. All right. So let's talk about what is respiration and how it relates to organic matter. So you've probably been to a lot of different talks with different soil scientists, and they all had a different way of characterizing fractions of organic matter. Uh, but they have the same progression. You go from living materials to uh, very dead materials. And the very dead materials, that's the organic matter that gives your soil some color, usually. 
uh, where, where the biology is going on is uh, usually with the uh, freshly dead materials, with the uh, crop residues, with the cover crop, uh, because that's where the food is for the organisms. The organic matter that's been in the soil for a long time, it's kind of like uh, puffed wheat. Uh, there might be carbon in puffed wheat, but uh, my bioassay of eating it says that there's not a lot of uh, available energy there. All right, so um, this is the manufacturing system you're working with if you're uh, trying to add organic matter to soil. How would you like this to be your potato processing facility that you feed in organic residue and uh, the product is you get uh, maybe 20% or so of your residue that transforms into organic matter that might stick around for years. But 80% of it is going off to, into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So uh, we feed organic matter to the soil and most of it heads right back into the atmosphere as CO2. Uh, the nutrients we get from organic matter comes about as through the microbial biomass, as the biomass, the bacteria, the fungi, etc., process the organic matter, they incorporate it into their uh, bodies, and as they decompose, they release the nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on. So having active decomposition is, is good in one way in that that's the source of the nutrients. So um, I teach a soil fertility class and I borrowed this from that class. I have a lot of trouble teaching students about what soil buffering capacity is for some reason. I show them these graphs and they just don't really get it. So I kind of developed a little magic show here. So I got two uh, reservoirs, uh, one that's green and one that's purple. And, uh, you know, I'm concealing something behind this uh, beautiful cardboard. Uh, and so the, the magician is taking out, or the scientist, I guess, is uh, taking out the same volume of material from both reservoirs. And he observes after that that, uh, wow, the, the uh, height of the reservoir of the purple one dropped a lot more than the green one. And so then, you know, what's the answer to why that is? Well, pretty simple that, you know, you just saw the level of, of water or the level of organic matter would be the analogy. But the soil on the right there, the purple one, is the Columbia Basin soil. It doesn't have a huge reserve of organic matter. So what you do to it, you know, can change the organic matter compared to what's there initially quite a bit. So they're pretty responsive to management, but they're also, uh, uh, you're, one way to think of it is that, that uh, nutrient management on a nice uh, mollusol in the Midwest, uh, that's, uh, that's a, a system that's pretty easy to manage because the system manages itself. Managing a soil in the Columbia Basin that is mostly sand and nutrients are coming in uh, supplied by you, that's a much more difficult situation to manage. Okay, so back to the question. Is the soil respiration test a good indicator of soil health? Well, if the major goal of soil management is to conserve organic matter, the higher respiration you have, the more organic matter you're losing. So in fact, uh, high respiration, like you'll get high respiration if you till a bunch of cover crop in, um, is that a good thing? Well, it's just indicating that the organic matter is being burned up and returned to the atmosphere. Okay, so next question. Uh, is a food web test worthwhile? What does it tell me? And what management response can I make to it? So this is a question that uh, it's probably a question that comes up probably at, at most workshops I go to talking about soil uh, because people love soil biology. I mean, who wouldn't uh, love a process that's, you know, all kind of uh, has all these uh, interesting organisms and all these interactions and you can get these pictures of uh, nematode trapping fungi, you know, where there's war down underneath there and so on. And so it just seems right that uh, 
you know, understanding who's there uh, would be important to understanding the biology. So uh, this is just kind of a, a, a scenery slide to uh, talk about uh, one form of a, of a food web. Uh, this must be the bite of somewhere. And uh, people are lining up, you know, for different uh, food trucks. Uh, so one of these lines is probably elephant ears, and another one is corn dogs, and uh, so forth. So uh, the idea being that, you know, different kinds of food attract uh, different organisms in the soil. So this slide here is put together by Doug, and he's trying to show you how all these things interact. I'm not as good of a soil biologist as he is, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through here. Uh, so basically, nitrogen comes into our system uh, in the form of uh, fixation, either by uh, a uh, fertilizer factory or by a legume. Uh, then it, if it's a, a organic material, then it goes into the organic pool, and then it begins, begins its decomposition process, and the decomposition process is complicated. There's all these different organisms and different trophic levels, just like you have in, in uh, above ground uh, biology. You have grass and you have cows. You know, you have, uh, in this system, fungi and bacteria are kind of your primary producers, and then you've got uh, grazers that feed on them. So you can have many arrows of many interactions and many cycles, and the end product is that, you know, as this is cycling through all these organisms, none of these organisms is 100% efficient. So you've got a leaky system and available nitrogens coming out as it's processed. So who's doing the processing and why might they be important? So, um, in most uh, laboratory cell biology tests, you're going to be looking primarily at the action of bacteria. And that's because most laboratory tests, you're going to deal with a soil that is uh, dried and ground. And so you, you know, you've eliminated all of the other biology except primarily the bacteria. Um, <clears throat> if you're able to go to a field and uh, measure things in the field, then you can measure things like earthworms and millipedes and springtails and so on. Uh, but uh, it's not really feasible to uh, collect soil and bring it to the lab and measure all these things in the lab. Most of the places that are doing food web, uh, they're only doing um, some kind of assay of uh, bacterial and, and a fungal activity. Some of them do uh, nematodes but almost none of them will do the whole uh, suite of organisms that's out there. Okay, so um, the idea here is that you have this biology that's built up, you have your, your earthworm burrows, and, you, and the earthworm burrows are lined with uh, different organisms, and you have this developed ecosystem and the number one thing you can do to destroy the system is to till it. Uh, this is uh, more aggressive tillage than you probably practice here, but the idea is that the more tillage goes on, the more unstable the system becomes, and the more simple it, it usually becomes because it takes a while for those other things to develop their ecological relationships. And so you're going to affect things that are bigger more than things that are smaller when you till. So you're going to affect things like the earthworms and the millipedes more than things like bacteria and fungi. Okay, so um, this has been a journey through the food web uh, by a, a uh, food web uh, observer, not an expert. Uh, and so I would say that, you know, do you want to do a food web test? Uh, Probably um, it might be in the category of interesting, but maybe not useful. Uh, if you're dealing with perennial crops where you know the soil isn't being tilled, then you can learn more than in a in a cropping system where there's lots of tillage. And 
in general, what people have come to over time is that, okay, so we know how the, we know in general relationships between biology and uh, food web and practices. So rather than uh, getting real detailed about food web, let's look at uh, some indicators that actually are, are a little bit easier to get a hold of. So these are the uh, list of indicators that uh, you'll find in, in, in the uh, current NRCS literature as to these are the big principles of, of uh, soil biology management, soil health management. And so the current idea, I think, in uh, promoting soil health is to empower the user more in terms of thinking about what their system is and what they do and uh, what is a reasonable practice they might actually do that might head things in the right direction. So we know that uh, because uh, we have all these different organisms and they don't all eat the same food, so if we have different kinds of uh, inputs into the system, we get better diversity. Um, if possible, having roots there present more of the year is going to be a positive because we have all these root exudates that uh, are also providing a lot of biology. The biology in soil, if you look at the rhizosphere versus that's the, the soil that's next to a root versus a little bit farther away, the biology in that rhizosphere is uh, 10 or hundreds of times greater than in the bulk soil. Uh, just mention this is a general practice that you probably all are aware of that uh, in general there's nothing good about uh, having soil that's uncovered. Uh, so if possible, having a mulch of some kind, cover crop residue is a good thing. Uh, this is one that's not in the official uh, NRCS uh, list, but uh, those of you that have livestock, uh, livestock, you know, you can kind of look at them as being a a different kind of uh, microbial consumer. Uh, they have, a, they have an, uh, an ability to, to eat uh, plant materials and transform them into something else. And then in general, uh, soil health is going to be better the less disturbance there is. Okay, so my area of expertise is more on the nutrient side. So I think one of the actual benefits of having a more complicated system as far as biology in soil is that it'll actually change some of the, some of the dynamics of nitrogen cycling. So this cartoon here is uh, comparing nitrogen cycling. I'll show you one that's in a uh, degraded soil. Just it's just called degraded because it's got to be contrasted with a, uh, the next slide. But in this system, most of the nitrogen comes from fertilizer. So we have a big input of fertilizer, we get a lot of inorganic nitrogen, and we tend to uh, have more potential for leaching in this system because we have a large input at one time. And there isn't that much cycling through the microbial biomass that keeps the nitrogen uh, tied up in organic form, it's all available for leaching. And it's not going to leach as ammonium, it'll turn into nitrate before it leaches. So it's basically that your system isn't very complicated, so you have more opportunity for leaching. Uh, if we contrast that to a soil that has uh, more inputs uh, that came from some organic source, what we see there is that uh, you know, more of the fertilizers going through the biomass and then being released into soil solution. So it's more of a slow release kind of a system. And because at any one time, there's not a huge amount of, of inorganic nitrogen there, there's less opportunity for leaching. Okay, so on um, biological indicators, you know, what do they really mean in terms of something you can do something about? Uh, you're all applying nitrogen, I think. So uh, something that would tell you uh, 
you know, how much credit to give for a particular management scenario that's different than the standard one, uh, that would be a very valuable kind of tool. And this is kind of the, a, uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, this has been worked on ever since I started working, and they're still working on it, and they haven't found uh, really universal tools that are very predictive across a lot of different soils. One really good success in, and this will kind of give you a flavor for uh, how limited some of these tools may be and how there's going to be a need to calibrate them for particular situations. Um, so there's a test called anaerobic incubation to determine uh, nitrogen mineralization potential. And that test was uh, put out there in about in the 60s. And nobody used it because they didn't really know how to adjust the fertilizer based on the test. So what uh, Neil Christensen and his collaborators at OSU did was they did a series of field trials where they, they took the uh, mineralization test and then they had a uh, nitrogen response trial and they could calibrate and see what the uh, credit that was associated with the lab test. And after 10 years or so of working on it, they were able to get a good system in place for winter wheat in Western Oregon. Notice I didn't say winter wheat, period. It's winter wheat in Western Oregon. And it's not ryegrass in Western Oregon or tall fescue in Western Oregon. They actually tried to calibrate it for those crops and found that it didn't work nearly as well as it did for the wheat crop. So if someone tells you that they have a biological test and it indicates something, your first question, I think, should be, show me the calibration data. Show me where you measured something with a test and where you evaluated whether it made any difference or not. So this is the uh, difference that uh, was found associated with that, that mineralization test was that as the, uh, the anaerobic incubation, or the N-min test in this case, as that value increased, uh, they got uh, more nitrogen that was released in the soil during the, 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 uh, the subsequent growing season. So these are soil samples that were taken in January or, or, or early February, and they predicted pretty well what was going to be released uh, during the March and April, the uh, season for wheat growth in Western Oregon. So if you look at these data points, what you see is that they don't sort out totally by crop. And that's the value of the test, is that not all uh, fields that are oats had the same kinds of values as the other oat fields. So having a test is uh, helpful. Uh, but you can also see some trends here that if you're following sweet corn, you know, those are some of the highest ones, followed by uh, rotating from grass seed into wheat. Okay, so um, how many of you have heard of the Haney test? Uh, okay, so um, I put this in here mainly because, you know, there's a, there's a lot of press about this and a lot of uh, excitement about it. Uh, the idea is that you're taking a soil sample and it will indicate an overall soil health, health score. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here to tell you a little bit about the test and give you some uh, feedback on you know, how this test uh, could be used or misused. Okay, so first I have to tell you what it is. So you collect a soil sample process it the same way you would a sample for an analytical lab. Uh, send it to the lab, they'll dry it out and grind it up. Uh, the lab uh, does an extraction for water-soluble carbon and nitrogen. And they calculate the carbon-nitrogen ratio of what's in the water-soluble fraction. And then they measure the respiration rate, which is they take the dry sample, wet it up as a, they have a protocol for this and they measure how much respiration happens in one day. And there is literature out there that shows that, um, at least in the samples that are reported, 
they get a correlation. The higher this uh, respiration is, the more labile organic matter there is and the more nitrogen release there is. So it's not that this you know, is a bad idea. It's just an idea that isn't uh, calibrated yet. So um, from those things, they calibrate an overall score. And the higher score is better. And I'm not sure of all the magic that goes into the, there's some kind of a model behind this. And these are the inputs, one, two, and three. And then the model comes up with the health score. And it's called the Haney test because Rick Haney with the USDA ARS is the uh, kind of the uh, author or he's uh, done quite a bit of work with this particular test. Okay, so the ultimate goal is to, is to calibrate this soil health score with the nitrogen mineralization potential of soil and perhaps other functions. So um, this, this, this new test was, uh, was quite a topic at a meeting I was at last year with the other land-grant university faculty uh, that work in soil testing. Uh, these are the folks that uh, you know, have spent uh, their careers uh, trying to calibrate all these different soil tests and say what a low value is, what a median value is, what a high value is give uh, fertilizer recommendations for the nutrient management guides. And so I took some notes and, you know, these are, this is kind of my synthesis of what they said, but in general, you know, there wasn't a lot of argument that soil health was a bad idea. People thought it was, it was a great idea, you know, to be able to understand more about the biology in soil. You want to be uh, doing things the best we can and have sustainability. Uh, and we think it's great that NRCS actually has some uh, interest and uh, put some um, effort into educating uh, growers about soil quality and soil health. Um, but they were pretty negative, really, about uh, whether the Haney test was a good idea right at the present. And the reason was that basically they don't think that it is uh, adequately correlated to a real response in a field. And it hasn't had this step that I talked about with the, uh, that particular nitrogen mineralization test for winter wheat in Western Oregon. That uh, before you can really say, you know, how to use this test, it really needs to have a, you know, kind of a evaluation under real world conditions and encounter all of the things that you're going to encounter when you start applying it to real farming operations. So um, I like parallel universes, and uh, you know, I think uh, we all like the Lone Ranger and the Silver Bullet, and we all kind of like Superman, because uh, you know, who, what's not to like about Superman? Can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, fight a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. Um, and I happened to come across a, uh, this is actually a, a Australian women's health blog that, that uh, somebody sent me uh, this and said, hey, isn't this like soil health? And I said, yeah. And so they're talking about uh, the uh, BMI or the, what is it, body mass index? And so they're, this is what I, what I read, that uh, we need to reinforce, stop, re reinforcing this idea, if you're thin, you're obese. As a, as a concept, it has nothing to do with soil health. And so on. Um, so the gist of this is that you know, it's not a good idea to apply a single score to talk about you know, whether people are healthy or not. And similarly, it's, it's probably not a good idea to have a single soil health score to imply that all soils are healthy. So I think really the idea of having this overall score uh, might be the problem. I think the individual Haney test might be very helpful for nitrogen, but I think it's a mistake to uh, try and uh, come up with a score that uh, is going to maybe have even some uh, cost share payment ramifications in the future that maybe you get paid more if 
for your conservation efforts if your Haney score is higher than if it's lower. All right, so that uh, concludes my uh, coverage of soil biological indicators, and I, I hoped I rattled enough cages to you know, get some good questions out of the group. And I think I'm actually ahead of time a little bit. Is that right? All right. Yeah. So we have plenty of time for questions. That had to stir some thoughts here. Come on, who's got a question or a challenge or? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that for the Haney score, they take respiration into account mm -hmm. for the total score. I was just wondering yeah. if that high respiration would give it a better score or worse score, because earlier you said for our soils, a high respiration might not be good. Yeah. Okay, so um, this gets in. His uh, question was uh, whether in the Haney process, how does the respiration contribute to the overall score? So from what I, from what I understand of the equation or model that's being used, uh, you're using the respiration and you're coupling it with a carbon-nitrogen ratio. So if you have a high carbon-nitrogen carbon ratio and high respiration, that means that you're actually immobilizing nitrogen that you got a lot of respiration, but you're decom decomposing something like straw. So actually, you know, you, you get a negative credit from that kind of situation. Whereas if you have high respiration and low carbon nitrogen ratio, then that'd be more indicative of a system that was being fed some kind of uh, organic fertilizer type material. So. I'd, I'd add to that the, what a lot of people are using as part of the Haney test is the, called the Salvita kit, mm -hmm. which is what actually measures the respiration. It was developed by uh, Will Britton at Woods End Lab originally, who's a compost guy. But there are people who are simply taking that and using on, that on their soil and saying, if I've got more respiration, that's good, period. So Dan, I don't know what your thought would be of that. I know what my thought is, but I know some folks are trying to use it in, in that very simple snapshot way, which I think has some problems because there's so many things that affect respiration. Okay, so I think I beat this into the ground a little bit already that uh, high respiration does not equal uh, soil health. Um, but what's fundamentally wrong with that concept, I think, is that people that do soil health measurements, if you look at their data over a year's time, you'll see quite a bit of variation during the year. In other words, you know, it makes sense that if you till in a cover crop, you get a big burst of respiration, and then it changes during the year depending on how the decomposition proceeds. So for sure, if you're gonna use respiration as some indicator, you've gotta find a period of time to do that test where uh, things have kind of calmed down from recent events. And that's kind of a general principle, actually, for any nitrogen mineralization test, is they won't work if you just did something. Like, if you just put on fertilizer and then you did a, a test, the fertilizer in and of itself is going to give a burst of respiration. So you need to find, if you're going to use that test, which I'm not really recommending, but in general, you want to find a period of time that the system is kind of stabilized. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question here. Dan, it seems like the N-min calibrations yeah. are less urgent or less important for us on our arid inland soils than they are on your western mm -hmm. Oregon soils. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that's right? Um, so I don't actually know that much data from this area. Um, did you all hear the question? So the question was whether some test to predict nitrogen mineralization was as useful for the Columbia Basin or inland as it is for west of the mountains. So um, I guess my answer would be that uh, you might find that it's uh, more interesting than you think. Uh, Brad Brown at University of Idaho, Parma, he's, he's retired now, but he did uh, quite a bit of mineralization work uh, with uh, taking soil and putting it in these uh, plastic tubes in the field and then measuring uh, 
in situ mineralization in the field during the season. He'd harvest these uh, kind of incubation chambers out of the field. And uh, what Brad showed pretty clearly was that in Ontario, Snake River Plain soils that had about the same organic matter you have here, 1% or so, uh, there were huge differences in mineralization rate that had to do a lot with when the crop residue was incorporated. So he could show that uh, if crop residue was incorporated in the fall, that uh, by the spring, the system was back to mineral, to generating plant available nitrogen that the straw was pretty much decomposed. Uh, he could show that when the straw was plowed down in the spring, that, that uh, um, the process of nitrogen getting immobilized by decomposition of straw, that was ongoing, so there was a big difference between those two. I mean, I think we knew that, but uh, this provided you know, some quantification to that. And uh, also, Clint Schock did some work over there using some other techniques, and they showed some numbers that were pretty high for mineralization potentials, a lot higher than you would think uh, you know, for um, those kinds of soils. And I remember uh, Dr. Brown, he had this slide, he, was, he, was, uh, he liked to show that showed there was absolutely no correlation in that environment between soil organic matter content and mineralization potential. You know, he only had a range of one to two percent, let's say, but uh, he got a perfect shotgun of uh, m mineralization varied according to some management variables, but it didn't, wasn't really reflected by the soil organic matter. Okay, I've got a couple of text questions about another test, that is the so Cornell soil health test. And two years ago, we actually had a person from Cornell come in over the phone and describe that test. It's being more uh, widely used. I think Oregon State is doing a portion of it. You, any comments on it? So um, the Cornell soil health test, I, I think that's a much more holistic kind of a test. The issue with it is just that uh, it's probably not logistically feasible for a lot of situations because a lot of these measurements need to be made in the field. Uh, some of them that can be made in the lab, um, until you get enough volume of samples in the lab, they're not going to want to do this test on a routine basis. So I think the, the components of their test is fine, but you'd need some local calibration, and you'd also need uh, some uh, commercial labs to take it up and be serious about it and actually you know, figure out how to run this test for an economical price. Uh, so, so the answer is basically, in, the Cornell test has a lot more going for it in terms of measuring different aspects of soil health, uh, but the problem is uh, it's complicated and it's also uncalibrated for this area. So uh, yeah, if you send a sample from here, they'll, they'll give you a green, yellow, red reading, yeah. but it's most of the data points in their system are from northeast U.S. soils, and that's where they do have the calibration. But yeah. What it means here is a, a bigger yeah. question. Yeah. Um, Andy, do we have time for one more? Or, or? One, more. Hmm? one more. Take one more question. <clears throat> Dan, just going back to the Inman test, uh, we ran a couple samples in Central Oregon years ago, and it completely overestimated the amount of nitrogen that was mm -hmm. going to be available from, from that test. Yeah, yeah so it's not comment. surprising that uh, what I've seen of nitrogen mineralization tests is that the way you make them work is by having a fairly uh, limited suite of soils you're looking at. So that way you eliminate, you know, all these variables that are naturally there to begin with. You're just looking at management changes. But it takes a long time to, you know, get a reasonable, to get this figured out. And I just don't know that anybody has the time and resources to really be uh, sufficiently dedicated to it, like uh, Dr. Christensen was for the Western Oregon test.